So today I'm going to talk about the opportunities and, and threats from Brexit, if I can get this to work. There we go. The reason I'm showing you this slide is that that's one of the sort of modern Scottish vessels. This is uh, not as big as some, but it's bigger than, than, than many, to be fair. And the reason I'm showing you it is that the fact is that it's going to uh, form the, back, the backdrop of the slides from, from here on in. The, uh, my organization, or the organization I represent, you probably don't know what it is, we operate in a political field. We cover many areas from crew welfare, fish welfare now, which is the most recent one. We created a company to supply fish boxes to the sector, but we take care of the politics of it. We horizon scan to see what's coming down the track, and we try and deal with issues that we think will harm uh, the industry over time. So we work with institutions, governments, we work extremely closely with the NGOs. We've close relationships with EDF, WWF, uh, not so much Greenpeace to be fair, but uh, we do have close relationships with many of the sensible uh, green organisations. We represent uh, 240 vessels, that's about 1,400 crewmen, uh, and they, the turnover, the gross revenue is about 250 million. So we are a significant player in the UK and in terms of the North Sea and West of Scotland, we are a significant player in what we remove from the, the stocks also. The, today I've been asked to talk about the opportunities uh, and the threats. So obviously the first opportunity is the ability to catch more of the fish in our waters. You've probably seen the SFF slogan, Sea of Opportunity. That's not that's not to make the pie bigger so we take more fish out of the water, it's just to make sure that we get a bigger share of the pie that's available. Uh, investment in job creation is a requirement for any in industry in the up, and we know that business doesn't like uncertainty. That's not just in fishing business, we know that in business in general, uncertainty is very much seen uh, as a negative. We've also seen in Europe paternalistic policy, it can have a bad impact on, on the way we behave. So in a post-Brexit Brexit scenario, we'd be looking to improve on the management, both of the stocks, but, but in terms of bottom-up policy as well. And, uh, you know, first and foremost, wow, these lights are bright. Man. First and foremost, we'd like to take the lead uh, over time to, 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 to be able to supply and be world leaders in the supply of, of quality sea fish. Of course, there are threats, and those threats uh, are probably quite obvious. And, you know, most of these threats are outside the defence of the industry itself. There's not much we can do to defend against those threats. And we're looking at, at government to be out there to defend us. Uh, and with regard to our inability to set management strategies for jointly managed stocks, we need to look no further, I guess, than the, the five-year deal on mackerel. And I'll talk a bit about that later. Uh, and it should be said, I guess, at this point, that, that non-tariff barriers are a real concern uh, for the sector. So in terms of getting a bigger share of the pie, I mean, we always talk, and I guess you've read some of it in the press, that fishermen just want more. But as I said earlier, we want a bigger share of what's available rather than, uh, you know, take more fish out to the sea. That would, that would be ridiculous. So the industry has carried out its own analysis with regard to who catches uh, what where. And I guess the alarming statistic is that out of the UK EEZ, we only remove 36% of the fish and shellfish in our waters. Uh, and that relates to about the value of about 800, 815 million. We caught a further 112 million from waters outside uh, the UK EEZ. A modest increase in that would take us up to uh, 1 billion. So up to 50% would give us a total in terms of revenue of 1 billion out of our own waters. And if you increase that up to 75%, that would mean that the UK fishing industry out of its own waters would remove something close to 1.3 billion. Now, that's not a massive ask when you look at what Norway takes out of its waters. For instance, 80-odd percent. Iceland, 90 percent. So what we are playing before you here isn't ridiculous and it isn't out of order. Now, no one's saying you get this tomorrow, but I think it's something we need to work toward. So we've got Aberdeen University, the SFF, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, who we are a member of, uh, contracted Aberdeen University to carry out a study uh, and it looked at 17 stocks of main interest to Scotland, and the search used fishery-independent ICES coordinated troll surveys as the basis, and the time period was 2011 to 2015. A comparison was made in terms of the fish in our waters 
compared to the amount of fish that we're allowed in terms of relative stability, and you'll hear that term used earlier, in terms of relative stability share uh, within that waters. And the results are, are actually quite startling uh, when, when you match them against the current allocation. And what I'll do is I'll go and try and put some scale onto that now. So if we look at the, uh, the information that was supplied, we can see here the 17 main stocks uh, of importance to the Scottish industry. Obviously, there's a large list. I think the EU sets quotas for 106 stocks each year. So these are the 17 that are of most importance to the Scottish industry. And that first column basically sets out uh, the percentage that we receive in terms of TAC. No, it's not coming up. Is it? Yes, it is. So this one here, that's the one that we set up in terms of what we get allocated for our TAC. So that's the relative stability share that we get from the EU. If you look at the next one, in terms of the zonal attachment, in terms of the study that was carried out in relation to the fish that actually swim in our waters, if you were allocating that on a basis of it's in our waters and it should be ours, then it goes up to 88% in herring, 60% in hake, 46% in saith, massive increases. And the column in the extreme right shows you how far short we are from that in terms of where we are to where we could be if you were using that zonal attachment strategy. Now, you know, we fully accept that there are other ways of, of, of looking at this. You could look at historic catches, you know, swept area. There's a number of other objective criteria out there that you could use. But if you use this one, it really gives you an eye-opener, I guess, in terms of what is available in our waters for us to catch. Moving on. The adaptive management, I mentioned earlier that the, the policy came out, coming out of Europe uh, at the moment, not so much now, but certainly uh, previously, is very paternalistic, it's very top-down. The fishing industry get very little opportunity to actually interact into that, and we need to learn from the lessons of the CFP. And indeed, in this early discussions with DEFRA, they recognise the fact that as we move into a post-Brexit situation, that we will and should build internal structures whereby industry and other stakeholders actually feed in so that the policy that we create is fit for purpose. I think we've learned from the past in Europe that if you create unfit policy, then you get all sorts of anarchic behaviour. And if we look back at the turn of the century, you know, there, there, there's various examples we could use to explain that situation. If we move on, in terms of the statement I just made about being inclusive, we can see that when you talk about fisheries governance, it's not just about the fishermen. You know, you hear the fishermen saying, we want to create fishing policy. But if you dig down, what they really mean is that we want to be taken seriously with others as we actually create that fishing policy. So what we're basically saying is trust us, we can be a trusted partner, and with others, we'd like to sit down with government, both regionally and uh, nationally, to create fishing policy away from what we're going to import from the common fisheries policy, the operable parts that we're going to import from the common fisheries policy. For us in Scotland, it makes sense to create regional fishing policy. Over the last few years, Europe has regionalised some of its approaches, and we now have various high-level groups in areas to set out discard plans and approaches to the landings obligation, which I will also go on to talk about, about later. But we shouldn't fear the fact that we try and create regional policy, policy that fits the fishermen of Scotland, policy that fits the fishermen of Wales or fishermen of England, or even round islands like Shetland. We shouldn't fear the fact that we create separate policy. As, as Marcus was saying, I fished for 30 years, 25 of those with my own vessels, and I operated in, in areas uh, in the Norwegian zone, Scottish zone, down in the English zone, up at Faroe, west of Scotland, Rockall. Each of these areas has a different fishing policy. So we do hear some saying, well, when we come out of Europe, we can create our own fishing policy. What we can create is our own high-level standards, and they need to be high-level standards about fishing to MSY, you know, sustainable harvesting. These are core principles that need to be a national interest. But at the end of the day, it makes sense to actually create fishing policy that solves issues for Scotland, solves issues for England. I mentioned earlier that the European system isn't fit for purpose. That diagram on the left actually shows you how policy 
goes from the start in Europe to the end. It's a very, very complicated pathway to the point the Commission has a thought, it creates a consultation document, it goes to the Parliament because of co-decision, and it goes all the way through the process. And if you look at the diagram on the right, that gives you for lobbyists, and I guess we are lobbyists, myself, Bertie Armstrong, and other in the room, others in the room, we are lobbyists. If you look at that diagram on the, on the right, it actually gives you an indication of the little areas that you can actually influence policy. And if you don't get right in at the very start, at the top left, where someone in the Commission is thinking in terms of their sole right of initiative, if you don't get in there, it's a slippery slope. And the next point you've got to influence is actually in the European Parliament. And that's where our colleagues, the, the environmental NGOs, are actually in there in vast numbers, making sure that as policy comes through the various stages in Parliament, they can impact upon it severely. And we see recently, an example would be uh, the pulse beam trawl. You know, there's big issues with that just now in terms of it being embedded into the, the, the new tech con regulation. And the resistance from the ENGO community isn't based on science or whatever, it's based, up, based on emotion. And when you start creating fisheries policy based on emotion, then you've got to accept that something has went uh, significantly wrong. In terms of our sustainability credentials, I think anyone out there who no, knows my organization, knows the SFF, knows me, you'll understand that over a number of years, we've been at the forefront of recovering cod stocks. We currently have six massive areas to protect spawning females. We liaise closely with government and others to try and make sure the MPAs are fit for purpose. So we liaise cl cl as closely as we possibly can, because at the end of the day, we've been through the bust. We've been through the bust. I was in there, almost lost my business just after 2000, when the stocks declined and there was a laissez-faire attitude to fisheries management and anarchic behavior crept in. So we've been there and we now recognize fully the responsibility that is on us as an industry. And post-Brexit, we would like to think that we could become, as I said earlier, a trusted partner in that, because the credentials we have in putting in closures at Rock Hall to protect uh, co uh, cold water corals, Lophelia, and you know, spawning areas west coast to protect uh, and recover blue ling, we were instrumental in that. And as we move into that post-Brexit scenario, I'd like to think that we could be trusted and actually be built into any development process. I mentioned earlier that one of the threats was that as we come out of Europe into the post-Brexit environment, that there could be all sort of dynamics where perhaps the coastal states don't agree. And that would necessarily have a downturn in the, in the stocks if that was the case. I'm not saying it as a possibility, but when you look at what the threats are and what could possibly come down the track, I think actually managing jointly stocks comes with its own threat. And you look at, at mackerel, in 2014 there was a five-year deal. There was three countries built into that deal, two countries were not built into that deal, Greenland and Iceland, although there was a third, Russia. Uh, but you look now this year, there's a possible 51% 50 reduction in the mackerel quota. Now, is that the result of people not signing up to that deal? Is that the result of other countries overfishing? I don't know, but in terms of threats, you need to identify in terms of industry that has a threat because it leads you into the bust situation from the boom situation. So it's an eyes wide open uh, situation. The other one is non-tariff barriers. Uh, you know, as a sector, we think, you know, tariffs, people will pay tariffs. It's, it's, it's a known, it's a certainty. doesn't necessarily concern industry, although you'd rather not pay tariffs if you didn't have to. But at the end of the day, the big threat, I guess, is non-tariff barriers. I mean, what we do know is that if you get a fresh non-life product stopped for 24 hours eh, eh, at, at Dover or, or, or wherever, the cost to the supplier is between 5 and 10% in terms of the value of that product. And after 24 hours, every 12 hours, it loses 10 to 15% of its value. So that is a real threat to the sector. And if you go and look at the species that we almost totally land in terms of exports to Europe, there's scallops in there, there's hake, there's monk, you know, these are species that are actually really important to the Scottish industry. So for us, the real threat is not so much the tariff, although we'd rather not pay tariffs, it's the fact, it's the unknown, it's the non-tariff barrier, the soft barriers. And it would be remiss of me to step off, off here without, uh, I guess, mentioning the biggest threat to the sector currently, and I just seen a massive smile creep over Mike Mitchell's face just now. 
the, the landings obligation. When we talk about what is the biggest threat to the sector currently, it isn't Brexit. You know, we'll deal with Brexit, I'm sure. The biggest threat at the moment is, of course, uh, the landings obligation. And the, the, the fact that the industry could, if it goes horribly wrong, be shut down in some of its main fisheries next year. A lot of the advisory councils have done a lot of work. Well, the Norwest Waters Advisory Council, which I sit on, and the North Sea Advisory Council has done a tremendous amount of work in terms of trying to identify what are the choke species for next year. And just to make you know, you're aware what choke species is, the landing obligation makes fishermen responsible from, for what they remove from the sea. You've got to record it. But if you reach the ceiling in any one quota, then that fishery has got to shut down. So it could be that in the North Sea, you're left with 100 million pounds worth of fish to catch. In the west of Scotland, you could be left with 30, 40, 50 million pounds of fish to catch because one minor species that you've exceeded or reached the limit has shut your fishery down. And it's that one species that we call the choke species. And if you look at the column there on the left, these are the species that the advisory councils have listed as potential chokes for 2019. And I guess the concerning thing for industry is that we've now been handed the chalice of, well, you better sort this out, your industry, it's your, your fault, you better go ahead and just do it. But I think we need to work out, you know, who's actually co-responsible for this. As fishermen, we accept our responsibility and we are actually getting on with doing the things that we need to do to solve the problem. There's a lot of work going on behind the scenes by the sector itself, investment, you know, commitment to deliver what we can. But there's other people in there in the mix as well, the producer organizations who manage the quota, member states who actually signed up to this without thinking what the unintended consequences would be, the commission who actually thought it up, and I guess the co-decision makers as well. And I relate related issue to the issue of the pulse uh, troll, the landings obligation as we're going through Parliament, we met repeatedly with the rapporteurs to tell them the unintended consequences of this. We were largely ignored. If we then go on to look at what we need to do to solve the problem, it would be useful if there was a key, clear pathway or a signal in terms of that compliance, a compliance pathway. What do we need to do to get through this? There is no you know, sheet for dummies here to the industry saying, guys, this is what you need to do. Industry has been left alone to actually do what it wants to do. And it would seem to be that there is no clear pathway to compliance, which for an industry like ours, which has done so much, as I've, I've hopefully showed you earlier, it is disappointing that we've almost been cast aside to solve this problem. I'm sure we will solve it, so no one go out of this room thinking they're giving up. We will solve this issue, and uh, hopefully we can move on to what we see as our vision. And I guess that vision is not unlike anyone else's vision in this room. Increased shares over a number of years, and we know this is not going to be del delivered immediately. We know it's, there's a time frame. Tailor-made regionalized catching policy. No one could disagree with the fact that industry should be bolted into that, and so should the scientists, so should the ENGOs, and other credible and relevant stakeholders. Greater participation of fishermen in the system. I talked earlier about that paternalistic, top-down situation. What we need to do now is create something from the bottom up. Uh, and essentially, what we need to do is actually create oh, benefits to the the coastal communities. We visited Norway with a delegation from the SFF recently, and there they talked about every light shining in the coastal communities. And I think over time, certainly my organization, and I know other organizations, are very much focused on everybody getting a share from the benefit of that sea of opportunity. Thank you very much.